Hi guys and welcome back. Today I have for you the 1744 Guarneri del Jesu nicknamed the Ole Bull. And I know that was supposed to be the mystery Guarneri but it wasn't and we felt bad that a lot of the commenters thought it was. But trust me this instrument sounds completely different. The mystery Guarneri to me was kind of underwhelming. This one on the other hand, well listen. instrument was played by many different people, but Ole Bull is the earliest recorded owner of this violin. He sold it in 1857 for 135 pounds to James Goding, and from then on it wandered around the world to many different players, the most well-known of which is Uto Ugi, and then it was bought by Chime in 1992. But let's get back to Ole Bull. So by nine, he had soloed with the Berghen Philharmonic, and he was already a sensitive and interesting musician. He had, though, a real problem with authority and was constantly trying to find shortcuts to work around his own technique issues. For instance, as a kid, he actually whittled the bridge of his violin down to make it flat, and that way it becomes easier to grab out four note chords on your instrument. So his technique in the earlier years was dubbed amateurish, and it often got in the way of his dreams to become a concert violinist. So his father eventually sent him to the University of Christiania, which is now the University of Oslo, and he was there to study theology, but conveniently he flunked all the exams and instead founded a chamber orchestra, which he led there for the next four years. His father, however, continued to urge him to do something more productive with his life, so he took off for Germany, where he pretended to study law, and in all actuality continued to perform and practice, and in 1831, visited Paris and heard Paganini, and there he became so obsessed with Paganini's sound, with this devilish, flamboyant, and incredible just way of playing, so he ended up staying in Paris practicing his butt off to overcome his technique issues and actually ended up rooming with Heinrich Ernst, who, if you don't know him, just YouTube the horror that is the last rose of summer and then imagine the two of them living in a flat in Paris together. I'm guessing they probably got some noise complaints from the neighbors. <laughs> actually paid off because, incredibly, he became immensely popular within a very short amount of time. This is partially from the flair he brought to his playing and also the fact that he played a lot of his own arrangements of Norwegian folk songs. This was all still very exotic at the time and interest in different cultures around this time was kind of whipped into the highest of circles, so Chopin actually is a great example of this with his mazurkas and polonaises, which were traditional Polish dances. So at any rate, he became an incredible virtuoso, toured all over Europe, all over the US, made a ton of money, and to top it off was lauded the absolute best likening to Paganini by Schumann and Liszt. He wrote over 70 works of his own, and I have heard none of them, and even became Grieg's uncle through marriage. Bull was enormously patriotic and was constantly laying the groundwork for Norway's own national art forms, and even paved the way for Grieg's acceptance into the Leipzig Conservatory. Along the way, he became extremely interested in communal socialism, which was, again, all the rage during the time. So when we think of that time, we think of Marx's Communist Manifesto as being the handbook for communism and socialism. But it's not necessarily so. These societal ideals were so in vogue at that time that handbooks, pamphlets, utopian novels, they were being published constantly by people most of which we've never heard of. And most of the time they were pretty awful. And at any rate, Bull thought he'd try his own hand at it. 
Only he actually had enough money to put a physical commune into play instead of just penning a pamphlet. So in 1852, he bought 11,144 acres of land in Pennsylvania and formed the colony New Norway. It's more often called the Ole Bull Colony. Um, there were four townships within it, New Bergen, Oleana, New Norway, and of course, Valhalla, where he himself would reside in his castle, which was really more akin to a giant cabin. The colony was populated with Norwegian immigrants who had come to create a peaceful communal farm living. It lasted, however, for only about a year before it started to collapse, mostly due to the lack of roads and transportation in the winter. Bull himself left for large periods of time to tour, pouring all the money that he earned into the colony. But due to his atrocious lack of business sensibility, the whole thing collapsed after the winter exposed the hardship of living there. And today it is still the Ole Bull State Park and there's a statue of him there in commemoration. <laughs> After this whole debacle, he continued to tour, particularly across the U.S. And actually, side note, in Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, there's actually a whole cavern littered with stalactites and stalagmites called the Ole Bull Room because he thought it would be pretty neat to do concerts in there, and he ended up doing so in 1851. So in his older years, fear not, he found himself a lovely 18-year-old bride, Sarah Thorpe, who was the daughter of a Wisconsin senator and they genuinely seemed to be very fond of each other, despite his very meddlesome mother-in-law, who apparently kept trying to show him off during dinner parties, and he would sneak off and talk with a professor friend, discuss Norse mythology, and eat anchovies until everybody left. So the marriage lasted until his death in 1880, and Sarah Bull devoted the rest of her life to philanthropy and Hindu philosophy. <laughs> So this is clearly a hell of a guy. I mean, the stories are ridiculous. So he did the bulk of all of this crazy stuff with this fantastic fiddle, the 1774 Guarneri del Jesu. So I'm gonna use those words again to describe the sound of this instrument. It is rich, it is powerful, it is broad, but playing this instrument, it felt like having a really good meal, like a really satisfying meal, you know? One cool little thing about this violin is also, well, if you look at most instruments, it's pretty common that the top and the bottom are going to be made from two matched halves of wood. So that means it's from the same piece of wood on the top and the bottom, and then they just put it together, as opposed to just one piece of wood on the top and one piece of wood on the bottom, although that also happens too. So in this case, the bottom is two matched halves, but on the top, it's actually unmatched. So one half is from the same log as the Sore del Jesu, and the other half is from the same log as the Heifetz del Jesu. So it has brothers, and that's pretty cool. a great deal already about the whole Guarneri family, so we'll get into Del Jesu's history a little bit more on another video. But he was active as a luthier from around 1715 to 1744. So 
this was actually one of his last instruments that he created. Anyway, Del Jesu's instrument are known for, yes, the darkness, the depth, the really rich quality, but also for the sweetness of the tone. Often it's one or the other, a deep and powerful tone or the smooth silkiness that's sometimes a little bit on the weaker side. This instrument does not compromise. And when I speak about it being broad, it really is a good thing. A broad sound encompasses so very much, and yet there is a core purity to this violin sound that you don't necessarily always get to hear in a full-on powerhouse instrument. <laughs> So we hope you enjoyed digging more into the life of Ole Bull and his beloved violin. It's pretty cool how he's no longer just a name in a textbook for me, but has this whole persona, and not only that, a park, which we totally have to visit now. So if you liked this video, give us a like, hit subscribe, leave a comment, and we'll see you all next time. Cheers! <laughs>